Nick, we're in the science shed again. I've got a joke for you. What is it? Well, I bought a pair of trainers the other day off a drug dealer. When Nick says about to tell a joke, he's got this like little kind of wry smile. You can tell he's laughing at him before he's even delivered the punchline. He's spoiling my comic <laughs> timing. Okay. I've All stolen right. it off my friend. Chris. All right. Do it again. Steve. Nick. I, um, I bought a pair of trainers off a drug dealer the other day. Yeah. I don't know what you laced them with, but I've been tripping all day. Hey. Should we get on with the podcast? All right. Yay. Steve. Bunsen. Dolly. Internal. Combustion. Why do we need? Petri. Oscar. Three. Isaac. Newton. Transplanting. Oh, hello, Steve. Nick, how are you? Well, uh, we were up in London, Guy's Hospital, again, in this lovely little spot. More um, podcasts. More podcasting. Um, but I'm a bit late this morning, wasn't yeah, I? Yeah, you were a bit late. Well, yeah, I, there's a good reason for that. What's the reason? Nick? I had Tell some me mechanical about issues with my car. Mecha- mechanical. Well, so, I think as, for people that don't know, I think your, you know, I think your car history is exemplary. It's just full of very expensive, very well maintained machines. So I can't imagine what could have possibly gone wrong. Yeah, I drive bangers. <laughs> <laughs> But this is the first non-banger let's, that let's, I've had. Let's and run. it's the first car that I've had a proper problem with. So this is it. So Nick's getting up. He's coming oh, to London. He's very excited about doing the well, podcast. Ham- Paint the at, picture, Nick. It happened at the weekend. But I had to take it to the garage. Serious mechanical fault. Right. When I was at my at my mum's house mm. over the weekend up in Northamptonshire, put all the stuff in the boot, closed the boot. Boot wouldn't open ever again. <laughs> close, it wouldn't close. close. Wouldn't open. It was it was constantly open and constantly closed at the same time. What do you mean? Well, on the dashboard it says boot open. <laughs> yeah. So you try driving the thing. Yeah. It bleeps at you every ten minutes. <laughs> right, which is annoying. Which is annoying. And when you try and open it, it won't open. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got like a superposition. It's like the the, the it's like uh, Schrodinger's uh, cat. cat. Yeah. Yeah. Is my it's boot open closed. or closed? It's both. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to. Um, so you're trying to pull it back to science there. So yeah. <laughs> yeah nice one. <laughs> Thanks. So basically, I couldn't work out how to do it. In my coat, a tiny corner of my coat. So yeah. I've also been cold this morning because a <laughs> tiny corner of my coat is stuck in the boot mechanism. So I can't get my coat out of the car. And I can't <laughs> open the bloody boot. So I took it to the mechanics this morning. <laughs> Did they just like shake right, their well, head? We've got a great mechanic. He's like, oh, I've got a problem again with the car, Mr. Evans. <laughs> See, I've got an annoying boot problem. Like, oh, we'll see what we can do. Just right. leave it here. I'm sure I can take the panelling off and yeah. get it open. We'll do a coat hanger job. This is how he speaks, right. by the way. It's a great guy called Mike. Mike Mattingly Motors of Southampton. A little, little plug there for Mike. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't do the internet, though. It's, um, it's a lot of mechanics, you know. But other people might in Southampton might need automotive repair, and now they know a good person. Absolutely, mm, yeah. Right. Go and see Mike. He's great. I think he's got plenty of work on. Anyway, so that's why I was cold and also late this morning because I had to take the car to the garage. All right, so we talk about some science. Yeah, let's get on with the podcast. <laughs> Nick, Steve, how you doing? I'm all right. Um, I'm just. Um, do you know what happened this week? What? So we have this thing in my Sorry, lab. Sorry, got distracted. Right? All right, what are you distracted by? Because there's people in the next room. There are, and they keep threatening to come in, but they won't. They we'll, won't. We'll just podcast them so so Maybe hard. Maybe we can get them to sit down with us. Anyway, I was right. interrupting you, Steve. You're about to say something. So we have. So you know, I work a lot. With, we got a lot of microscopes in my lab, right? Yeah, that's and one your of, job. One of my one of my bugbears that I have is Bear. is bugbears. Bears. I have multiple bugbears. We've talked about you being a bear, haven't we? <laughs> this might be on a different podcast. So t- tell me about your bugbear. Uh, so one of the things another really... class of bear. Apparently, in the in the bear in the gay community amongst mm. bears, there's another class of of um, of sort of subtype of bears called otters. Oh, I've heard of that. So they're bears, fact, you've but told me about this. As, yeah, they're not quite as hairy. You seem a little bit inter- very interested in the gay community, Nick. Well, I am interested well, in the gay okay. community. I went to Iceland last year the, 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 to Reykjavik, <laughs> and it coincided with a party called Bears on Ice. Right. Which is a big bear, gay bear party wow. when they all go to the Blue Lagoon and, and have naked. a big pool party. No, they they they're very they're respectable, <laughs> nice people. They just go there in their right. swimming trunks and just have a few just drinks and a guy plays and some dance. DJ songs. Yeah. And actually, no, this is another coincidence. A friend of mine in Australia, Colin Gaff, he's a DJ. He um 
he DJed at Bears and Ice the previous year, but he wasn't there when I happened. Oh. So we just happened to rock up by me just accidentally. But we were we were staying in a sort of Airbnb sort of place. Yeah. And in the next room, there were these two Northern Irish bears. Right. One was definitely a bear. You know, it's Big, a, huge, my, bearded man. I just imagine. Uh, but his, his boyfriend bear. was was a sort of didn't look very bear like. Yeah. And then I found out subsequently from my friends who were bears in the community <laughs> that he was an otter. <laughs> so an otter. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So microscopes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Saging back. <laughs> Some people would have like a strong oh, segue. Oh, bugbear. You're bugbear. Yeah. yeah. So bugbear. I was wondering whether there was another subgenre of bears called a bugbear. Bug bear. What right. would they be like? Well, I'd imagine they'd probably be quite small. Small. Smaller. Maybe very, it, creepy? It, 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 like irritated easily. Maybe. <laughs> or they would irritate easily. Oh, well. Yeah. Anyway, um, in the context of your microscope, what's, what was your bugbear's do? So um, so one of the things that we do, we, we get a lot of images, like, like we... we you know, talk about science and we show images that come yeah. from the microscope. Yeah. Pictures. One, pictures. Mm. And one of that, that is a synonym for <laughs> images. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things I get, I always ask for a scale bar on my, on my images. Well, right? you need to have a scale bar. On your That's images. right, Nick, you do. And I, I have a thing in my lab. I'm like, that's we, a bugbear in mind. We have a colloquialism. Is that your bugbear? Massively. Oh, good. I'm so, glad. but we have it in the lab, right? This is my kind of colloquialism. I say, you have to put a scale bar on any image you show. If you don't, I get to punch you in the face. Oh my god! What? And if and if and if, but the thing is, if I miss one, they all get to punch me in the face. That's that's what I kind of tell them, right? And obviously, I don't really punch me in the face, but it's a kind of like, face it's a, exactly punching. a kind of like an intellectual face punch. Ah. So no, we, I've said this. You know, we did say you this forget a scale bar? No, but I did punch a student in the face. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so I was at Should this conference. Be saying this, I was at this conference. Are we going to put this? It on was there? A, it was an accident. <laughs> You accidentally punch someone what, in the face. Actually, so we're, I'm at the... just turning around with a closed fist, swinging your arm around. <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry. It was a complete accident. So we were. I was at this conference on Monday with a PhD student of mine, and we were coming back. This was to... in America again. No, no, no. Oh, no. This is, this in is a different. Com- this right. is a conference um, in. It was by Heathrow, so far less glam- Rock glamorous Rock than Rock uh, Rock. than New York. But I was coming back, and we were coming back on the tube. Uh, through London to get to King's Cross to go back to Cambridge, and um, like you know, as the ju- as the circle line normally does, it like judders, uh, and uh, and she kept she kept flying and she just flew into my fist, right? It's, so it's kind of like Baldrick in Black Adam exactly, running, running into, into my fist. But anyway, yeah. so so we came. I came in yesterday. And she's got like a proper black eye. Oh my god, Steve. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm serious. You've punched it. I punched. I literally punched my student. Are you saying this and, story and, now as a cover, cover and, story? And I, I, no, I've been I've been on record many times saying if they miss a scale bar, I will punch, punch them in the face. face. Oh my god! <laughs> so what do I do, Nick? I've got I've got to have a cover story. I've got to get out. Actually, she was very good about it. She, you know, she was mis- it was an accident. But, so you but, were. So but what literally, were you but this is what happened. This is what you were happens. Holding your fist. I was just standing there. I was you were like, standing there with a fist. <laughs> Like kind of like well, no, braced, no, my... bracing your arm <laughs> with a fist neck. out of arms like with my you, elbow locked, up. and she just happened. Oh, I'm sorry. Yet the train stopped and she staggered forward, and her face just connected with, <laughs> with my, my fist. fist in exactly the right way. Yeah. <laughs> so, just going back to reality. Yeah. What, how did that happen then? So she just kind of like just kind of lurched forward. Where was your fist? It was on the the pole of oh, the, so of the if tube. If so if your fist hadn't been there, she would have just smashed her face off maybe, the pole. Maybe. Something like that. That's my, that's oh, my so argument in the law court. But, but to the, the rest pole. of the lab, this is what happened. Is we went to a conference and then and then someone came back with uh, with a black eye. And and but she, and she didn't give she gave a presentation or she gave a poster and I've just got to double check that hopefully there's scale bars on that. Otherwise I am <laughs> in a court of law. I'm going down. <laughs> I've already reported you while we've been talking about it. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> Don't like autumn. Don't like autumn. Why not? Don't like the, it's the, the season of death. The, the season of death, and which is correlated with Donald Trump being elected. Oh, <laughs> do, why do you have to bring that up again? It's, everyone's talking about Donald bloody Trump, and it's depressing every time it's mentioned. I tell you what, should we cheer everyone up by talking about some science? Yeah. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Telephone. 
Nick. Oh, Steve, I've been reading a really good book recently. Really good book. Yeah, What's it's book? an autobiography of a chap called George Gamow. Have you heard of George Gamow? I haven't heard of George Gamow. Who is George Gamow? So it's called My World Blind. So George Gamow, he's a he was a mathematician and physicist, physicist theoretical right. physicist in the early part of the 20th century. And he's famous. He's not he's not one of these people who's won a Nobel Prize, but he's famous for doing stuff like discovering quantum effects. One of the things he discovered was um, alpha particle emission. Oh, you cool. Know, radiation. Helium and nuclei. Al- exactly. Yeah. An alpha particle is two tiny neutrons, two protons, and they shoot out of an atom. But in classical physics, people didn't really understand how that could happen energetically. Right. So he applied quantum, um, the theory. new quantum theory to it, and basically it's, it's a tunneling. So it's a probability effect. Right. The energy comes from quantum physics, yeah, it's basically. De- it's not deterministic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't understand it, but he was involved in it. And he's more famous. On, okay, quickly. <laughs> so we should talk about, we should do a quantum course. Maybe we get someone who knows about it. <laughs> I teach it. Do you really? I teach quantum mechanics. Well, the, the, quantum mechan- the, chemists, the quantum mechanics for chemists, I so teach. So you're a poor man's quantum Terrible, <laughs> very, very poor man. <laughs> Well, that'd be interesting. But anyway, he he discovered um, he discovered that, and he also later in life he, he's famous for publishing a series of books called the Mister Tompkins series. Oh, I have yes, Mister okay. Tom- There's a famous one called Mister Tompkins Goes to Town. Yeah, and the idea is it explains relativity by imagining a world where the speed of light is much slower. Right, like instead of what is it? So all of the relativistic three, effects become instead of like- yeah, instead of three billion meters per second, yeah. it's like. 30 meters per second or something. Right. So they all become obvious to people in everyday life. Yeah. But anyway, this book is classic. There's so many stories in it. Well, there was one thing he he talks about. He's he's kind of like a racket, sort of a wit and a raconteur and a bit of a farcer, joker and a, you know, trickster. Guy that you'd like to probably go for a Guy with with. a sense of humor, man. Do you think it would have been good to So many good stories in this book. Right. Do you think it would have been good to like have as a colleague? Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. You'd like to go for a cup of tea in the faculty lounge. Yeah, he's a bit off the wall. Right. It could get you in trouble, I reckon, if you hung right. around with him too much. You'd like wake, wake up with a few bad hangovers. So there's a few interesting stories, right? right. Um, we could maybe spread this over another podcast as well, but I just want. There's, give, there's give me one. one. Well, Hit one of me. them. I I'm just excited. Want to, so he talks about his first, what, the, the experiment that made him a scientist. Right. So I'm going to ask you at the end whether you, there's anything that happened in your upbringing that sort of tuned you in to wanting to do science. Right. And for him, He's talking about his life, early life in um, in Russia. He's a Russian guy. Yeah. Um, in in Odessa, right? And perhaps in well, annexed by Russia now. He used to be mm-hmm. in Ukraine. Um, and he talks about one day his his dad bought him a microscope, and he wanted to try and find. out. He was going to church, and he yeah. wanted to try and find out. He'd heard this thing at church. They said that you know the bread turns into the flesh of Christ, and the wine into the blood. So what he did was he decided to, you know, he took this microscope home and to, to try and work out whether this was correct. He did right. an experiment. So he says in the in the Russian church, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do his accent in this kind of. Um, you don't know what he sounds like. No, he's, no, no, he's no. But gonna... he's a Russian dude, but he's a provincial Russian. Right. So let's translate it to England. So I'll do it in a provincial English accent. <laughs> so, right. so in the Russian church doing communion. The red wine and the bread dropped into it, turning the blood and flesh of Christ our Saviour, Jesus Christ. On one occasion, when the priest gave me an ounce of transubstantiated wine and a, cr- a crumb of bread on a gold-plated spoon, I kept the piece of bread crumb in my cheek and quickly ran home and put it under my microscope. For the sake of comparison, I had earlier prepared a similar piece of bread crumb soaked in red wine, so I had a control. Excellent, excellent. Look, look control experiment. My- you need the controls. Right, right. Looking into my microscope, I could see no difference between the two specimens. Oh, what does that tell you? The texture of the two pieces of bread was exactly the same and quite different from the texture of a tiny piece of my skin, which I Irish cut from now. the end of my finger. <laughs> well, this is what happens in, uh, in Odessa. It's getting annexed, you know, okay. sometimes communists. Oh, yeah, so you're actually reflecting the, the, the changing political landscape right. with your accents. Right. Well, look, the colour of the town blue <laughs> taken home from church was still reddish, but my microscope was not strong enough to recognise individual blood cells. This I had only half proof, but I think this was the experiment which made me a scientist. Wow. What do you think of that? He had a control, a couple of controls That's there. amazing. He had a negative control, control, and he had his flesh, he had his, his skin as a positive control. He right. was a kid. That's, that's very impressive. So do you think for that's all of you budding scientists out there, yeah, I think, think my feeling is the quality of your science is determined by the, 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 your controls. 
I agree. What you can you're comparing it. Science is just comparing one thing with something else. The only thing between science and larking around is writing it down. Mm. <laughs> anyway, was there anything, Steve? Did you ever do anything like that? So I did. I cut open my finger to get some blood to put on my microscope in a similar kind of way. I've still got the scar there with Why'd a scalpel. You do that? How old were you I, then? Well, how old were you get your first microscope? Five, six. Oh my god! So you cut yourself just. So I you had a scalpel it. in the kit, and I think you're supposed to like slice something. So I just sliced my finger oh, open. That wouldn't happen these days. Yeah, you probably get a not. Scalpel. Yeah, it's probably really unsterile too, because it's probably like sat in my drawer, covered, getting covered in fluff. Um, but yeah, I did that. And yeah. Got some blood and put it on my microscope to have a look at that. But um, was there an experiment that really? It was. It was never an experiment. I would say. I would mm. say. I definitely really enjoyed finding out about the world. I definitely in science class and things finding out how does that work. Particularly, I like. I like the periodic table. Really liked the periodicity. Like, why do things change? The fact that as you move along, every it, it just it's so beautiful, right? That every every nuclei uh, every nuclei increases its atomic mass and the neutrons and electrons. I really well, loved all of that. I suppose the periodicity of it's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah, you, know, you would get the repeating properties of elements as you that, go up, and people didn't know why that happened until Mendeley came along. <coughs> that's true, and then you also have these examples of like technetium, right? So technetium is a is a element for people that know in the periodic table, which is in the transition metals, and actually when they built when they first assembled, like you say, when Mendeley assembled the first periodic table there was a gap in it and they said oh this doesn't make sense so there should be an element but um they couldn't th- but they hadn't discovered it at that point well that happens lots of elements in, in mendeleev's period but, he left spaces that yeah. was his genius yeah yeah, yeah yeah um but technician was in fact i think has been discovered um uh in the natural world now, yeah. but it was the first one that to be artificially made. Oh wow! Right? And so, so that was so the they were like, "There's a gap in the periodic table where this element should exist, and <clears> we can't find it in nature anywhere." Yeah. So they had to go and whack it in a in a, in a high energy accelerator. I think it's. Sure. I don't. So I don't have. I don't remember doing any. I think I was interested in nature and the na- the natural world. You know, I was into bird watching and things, right, which is not quite the same. But by the same token, I was interested in like the meaning of life and. <laughs> So the, you're a philosopher. Uh, I think maybe I missed my call. Well, you know, I was really into the planets and you know planets. And, oh yeah, and all love the, the stars, dinosaurs and, and planets. Stuff. Every kid is into yeah, dinosaurs I and planets. So. But I, I never did an experiment like he did, and I think, oh, does that make me less? Do you reckon he did? I reckon that's like I think, made up, I think I think that's made up. There's loads of other it's good that, stories. It sounds like quite a bombastic gentleman. I'm sure he can just like you probably would. You could probably retrospectively apply meaning to things when you're just being a kid. You know. <laughs> Another story from um, yeah. this book is talking about. So again, he's in Odessa. Yeah, um, hanging growing, out, growing hanging up. out, growing up, and at the end of the First World War, yeah, the Russian Revolution happened in was it nineteen seventeen? Uh, like I think so. Yeah. So the the uh, there were battles, and constantly other countries were involved. Yeah. Crimea was constantly being invaded, taken by the communists, tumultuous times, taken back by the Tatars and other other people. Constantly flipping between being communist and mm-hmm. imperialist, and he, he he talks about a story. One of his friends was a professor professor of physics in Odessa. He's called Igor Tam. Igor Tam. Have you yeah. heard of Igor Tam? The name sounds familiar. He won the Nobel Prize for physics in 1958. So he goes to the local village. Igor Tam does um, when Odessa was occupied by the communists because yeah. they're all starving. They've got no food. So they take a load of silver spoons out to barter for yeah. food with villagers. It's quite a dangerous thing to do. Yeah. So um, as he was doing this, he said the village was captured by one of the Mac- Makino bands. So these were kind of the, some of the group of people yeah. who were against the communists. So they saw his city clothes. They brought him to the Ataman. The Ataman was a bearded fellow. In a tall black fur hat with machine gun cartridge ribbons crossed on his broad chest and a couple of hand grenades hanging from his belt. <laughs> okay, baddie. Yeah. Sounds like says, a baddie. Says, and then he says, he says, here we go. You son of a bitch, you communist agitator, undermining our mother Ukraine. The punishment is death. But no, answered Tam. I'm a professor at the University of Odessa and I've come here only to get some food. Rubbish, retorted the leader. <laughs> what kind of professor are you? <laughs> Oh, I've mathematics. heard this story. I've heard this story. Mathematics, says the Atman. Yeah, this All is right. great. Then this g- give me an estimate of the error one makes by cutting off McLaurin series at the nth term. Do this and you'll go free. Fail and you'll be shot. <laughs> <laughs> so Tam could not believe his ears. The problem belongs to a rather special branch of higher mathematics. 
Under the muzzle of a gun, he worked out the solution and handed it to the Ataman. Correct, said the Ataman. Now I say you really are a professor. Go home. <laughs> Who was this man? No one will ever know. If he was not killed later on, he may well now be lecturing on a higher mathematics in some Ukrainian university. That's good. I There's like that. That's, uh, that's important, right? Just in case, you know, you have to barter for your life Don't by know. solving... Again, it could be just thing. a load of old balls, couldn't it? <laughs> I hope to not think so. I mean, I mean, Euler is another famous French, uh, another famous mathematician that lost his life um, uh, uh, in a duel uh, over a woman, I think. That was mm. the... And these are the other things which I find quite reassuring as well, right? Because this is a guy who was the forefront of, you know, um, theoretical physics. Yeah. And he's publishing a paper, right? So he's doing a paper on um, quantum physics and he's talking about something called pilot waves. This is how all to do with um, quantum tunneling and things yeah. like this. And he, um, he has to do a, a, an equation, he has to solve an equation in order to, to progress his paper. And it's the expression the square root of 1 minus A over R to the DR, whatever that means. I don't yeah. even know what it means. Didn't know how to do it. So he went to a Russian mathematician, and the, this is apparently dead easy. <laughs> if you're a mathematician, it's like bread and butter. It's like yeah. elementary maths. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he wrote the paper after asking for help with it, and when he, when it appeared, he, you know, the other professor was acknowledged, and he became a laughing stock <laughs> <laughs> the Because they realized what the, the extent of his contribution was. was. Right. But it just reassures me that even people at the very forefront are like, I don't know how to do that. Sometimes they just don't know how to do stuff. That's it's great, like really though. easy stuff. Well, I think there's a real there's a um, there's a real strength in a character to, to ask for help, right? It's to say like, yeah, I don't know how that works. Help me. Are you um, good at doing that, Steve? Am I good at asking for help? I am if I don't know if I particularly our biological collaborators. Cause I don't know any biology, Nick. <laughs> Um, I don't actually you know. Do you know what the Why difference are you is? Me? The, the thing is, like, I don't know how hard some things are, right? So sometimes we have uh, conversations with our collaborators, and I'll say something like, "Oh, can you purify that? Or can you send us some more of this or something?" And the answer, because sometimes it's really easy in biology, like, "Oh yeah, no problem. That'll take a day or a week." The other day, I was like, "Oh, can we purify this complex?" And my collaborator turned around to me and went, "No, Steve, that's a Nobel Prize if you can do that." <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of you just don't know relatively how difficult some oh, no, things are. I think so. There's another good example of that recently in what we we're doing this. <clears throat> Where we we put in, we we put a drug in a tiny particle, a mm. nanoparticle, and then we give it to some cells. Yeah, the cells eat up the nanoparticles. Yeah, and then something gets switched on that we that we measure. So you measure the up the the thing getting switched on when you you put the thing in the nanoparticle and compare yeah. it to when you don't use the nanoparticle. So you want to try and find out whether there's a difference in the effects. So I just want to find out right with the cells how much of that drug is there in yeah. the cells afterwards how yeah. much it's so i'll give you some cell lysate tell me how much of that thing there is in the cell so you, you know the molecular mass of the yeah of the, just mass spec it okay well i'll give it to you then Steve. yeah do it when you well i gave you I, if you may remember that i gave you some samples some time ago do yeah. you remember that maybe yeah you've forgotten that yeah. <laughs> i've forgotten that shall yeah. i do it again do that. <laughs> but so you <laughs> I, I have lots of people give me samples, Nick. <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, it's no, just I'm the, serious. We should do it. Send it to me. I'll send we'll mass spec it. Oh, That's then. the way to do it. And then we've got proof of this. As long as you know the mass of the of the, of the of drug. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. really easy. But I don't think it... But people have told me it's not straightforward. I've had people can, can say they're doing mass the spec. People say they're doing HPLC. You can lyse the cells, yeah. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So we're looking for specific... Um, we're taking human spinal fluid in the lab and we're, and we're purifying it via via a special compound and then uh, we're trying to determine the protein composition so we're doing you know on bead mass spec and then uh digestion on the Bro bead. DRMX. exactly Bro kind DRMX. Of. well no because we don't we just we all want to care is, is there one protein there or not so so, so i'm a... saying it's a background of a complicated mixture right. and we can see a single protein all right. okay so, tell me how you want the cells i'll give you them give me the lysate we'll do it yeah yeah we'll tell if it worked all right if and then it's we'll really tell... hard then i'll say steve you've sorted it out do I get? Do I get? But if, if I don't want to be acknowledged, then then be a laughing stock. So maybe I shouldn't help. <laughs> What's annoying, Nick? Nick. Hello. Do you know? I was just reading the BBC website and something mm. in there that I think you might find interesting. Hmm. So, people have found a, a star, right? Hmm. It's called Kepler 11145123. It's a good name, huh? Kepler 
four five one two three. Do you know why it's a a? Did important... I remember the number then? No. Uh. It would have been impressive. Um, uh, do you know why it's it's it's, it's, it's that's an interesting star? The, because it's the astronomers claim that to have that that's the roundest object in the known universe. Oh, that's fucking annoying, Steve. <laughs> It's the roundest object. Yeah. You mean the most spherical object? The most spherical object, yeah. And how far away is Kepler? Um, that's a good question. It is. Doesn't say. How do they know it's the roundest object? So Are you me- just getting this from the BBC website? <laughs> this is annoying me as well. You're just looking at the BBC bloody web. What kind of scientist are you? A you should be one. looking at the original literature. You just found a website <laughs> on the BBC, <laughs> just randomly on. <laughs> Oh, I'm not the science podcast information. Let's look on the BBC website. <laughs> that is exactly what I did. <laughs> Doubly irritating. Um, yeah, it's really round. It's uh, it's twice the size of the sun, and its radius doesn't deviate from the poles more than three kilometers. What in, expressed as a percentage? Three kilometers of the total, the the maximum deviation away from the sphere on something that's twice the size of the sun. Oh, right. So it's very flat. Well, I'm really fascinated. <laughs> Bunsen, Burner, Dolly, Machine, Internal, Combustion, Why Do We Need, Petri, Dishes, Oscar, Bay. Isaac, Newton, Transplanting. Do you like Ferrero Rocher, Steve? Um, yeah, I, I feel like it's a bit cliched, but yeah, I do, yeah. I feel it's cliched. It's I'd... Christmassy, though. And we're getting close to Christmassy. We're going to do a Christmas special of the, of the science shed. Coming up. Yeah. Uh, which we haven't, which we haven't recorded yet, but I'm sure we'll be good. We're going to do the video again, like we did with the Nobel special. Did you like that? I did. It was quite fun, wasn't it? It was really good fun, and we should do a Facebook Live thing as well, we're shouldn't gonna, we? Yeah. So if people like what we're doing, they should uh, follow us on social media and and share and subscribe and spread the joy of the science shit around. How, yeah. how would they do that, Nick? Oh, you can tweet um, me on at the Evans Lab, and I'm Steve the Chemist on Twitter. So please get in contact and uh, all that social networking jazz. Yeah. Um, and we'll keep doing this. Absolutely. All right. Mm. <laughs> Ferrero Rocher. <laughs>